Welcome to GCC 2022. It's great to see everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. And, and before we get started, I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone and thank you all for journeying out of your Zoom rooms and joining us in person. Um, my name is Jim Wilgenbush. I direct research computing at the University of Minnesota, and I'm one of the uh, co-sponsors of this event. Um, like I said, it is great to see everyone in person, and we thank you for uh, traveling here to meet with us again outside of your Zoom room. Um, as I mentioned, my, my area is supercomputing, um, but my actual field of work is phylogenetics, and I've been doing that for um, close to 30 years now. And so the work that Galaxy is doing is especially meaningful uh, to me from the standpoint of recognizing very early in my career that not everyone was super comfortable with the command line and things needed to be done to lower those barriers to access resources uh, that would help to advance their work. But it's not really about advancing, you know, their um, uh, or, or lowering barriers to high performance computing for the sake of that. It really is fundamentally important, I think, for us to be able to make uh, discoveries, specifically those that we might often call grand challenges. Without interfaces that can serve sort of as a, a nexus uh, to different communities, it's really uh, going to be impossible for us, I think, to uh, make astounding discoveries. So the work that you're doing the discussions that you have today are really essential, I think, for what is increasingly seen as team science and essential uh, for the grand challenge type discoveries that we have today. And so just to, to get sort of a little bit um, active here, I, I'm going to ask the question, uh, who among you would consider yourself classically trained in, let's say, computer science or software engineering, if that's your first language, so to speak. Raise your hand nice and high so everybody can see. Okay. And then who among this group uh, would consider yourselves domain scientists, first trained as maybe biologists or chemists or what have you? Wow, that's about an even split. That is pretty awesome. That's great. And so, um, so one of the things that I think uh, Galaxy has done, and certainly this community uh, promotes, is lowering bang, uh, barriers around the language that we use. And I, I, I suspect that many of you work together and have probably spent a good amount of time sort of um, with your virtual dictionary, aka Google, sort of looking up terms that people sort of throw out there. And, um, and I think much of this will happen uh, this weekend as we get to understand, or this week as we get to understand uh, what each of us uh, are, are doing. So again, thank you for attending in, in person. And uh, we certainly appreciate your presence here. I just wanna say a, a quick few thanks to some of the meeting organizers. And then uh, Tim is gonna talk a little bit more about the scientific community and thank them. Uh, particularly, I want to thank uh, Jen uh, Bessio. Jen, are, are you here now? Raise your hand. She's probably Great. Um, in addition, uh, uh, JJ Johnson, uh, I think you're here. JJ is in the back. Thank you for joining us. Uh, is here. Where's Pratik? Pratik, thank you, Pratik. Sarah Langweir um, was not able to come. She was traveling last week and, or the week before, and she um, tested positive for COVID. So she regrets not being able to be here in person uh, to see what her work um, has has done. Um, last, we also thank you, thank you. And, and last, we want to thank the Sapphire Group. Um, is there are there members of the Sapphire Group here? They're probably out uh, at the desk, but they have uh, also played an important role in helping us bring this event to fruition. So thank you again uh, for being here. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim. All right, thank you, Jim. Hi, I'm Tim Griffin. I am a faculty member here at the University of Minnesota in biochemistry. I'm one of those great unwashed non-computer science trained people who tries to convince people I know some about bioinformatics and Galaxy helps me do that, I guess. Um, 
So uh, really wonderful to see everybody. I think it's been three years since we've had an in-person Galaxy meeting and that was Freiburg, I believe. So it has been quite a while. So it is great to see you all here. Um, yeah, I just wanna follow up with what Jim said, thanking it, it takes a lot of people to uh, uh, put together a conference like this. Um, we got the news when we were starting to do this that Dave Clements, who's here, decided to take a new challenge and, and go to Anaconda. And so after some initial panic of, oh my God, what do we do without Dave? Jen, now Jen, is she's already been thanked, but she's in the back here. Jen, thank you. She's, uh, has helped us along the way, but the transition I think has been made. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. I also wanna just thank the scientific committee, uh, committee that really worked hard to put together the program um, and that is Asunta DeSanto, and I'm not sure if everybody's here in person that was on the scientific committee, but so Asunta was part of that. Um, Bea Serrano Salano, who was also a part of that. NS Afghan, who you're gonna see up here in a few minutes, and also Sabina Mehta, who's back here. So maybe we just thank all of them. Just a couple of logistic reminders. So we are requesting you wear a mask unless you're eating and drinking. Uh, thank you to New England Biosciences or New England, what is it, NEB. <laughs> I don't want to miss, misspeak in, in their, their uh, trade names, but NEB helped with the, the tests that you all have. So we're requesting you use those. That we're just doing whatever we can to try to minimize risks. Um, uh, just a couple of other things. If you are a presenter uh, presenting up here, we need you to sign a waiver, which is uh, the, the permission to record. So we're trying to record the talks as we go here. Um, and also, if you could today uh, meet with Jen or Subina and get your talks uploaded so they can get these on computers, uh, that would be super helpful to have those in place. So that, that's the request. As some of you know, um, the white tables are, are supposed to be reserved for eating at, but then when we have the sessions in here, we can sit up here at, at, at closer, so definitely you can make your way up, but that's the, uh, the request we've had for, for eating. Um, I think lastly, I'll just thank the sponsors you're going to hear from. We have a, a good list of sponsors that are helping support the conference, so we're very much thankful uh, to the sponsors as well. Um, I think that's all I have. Did I forget anything back there? Are we good? All right, excellent. Okay, so welcome. Uh, the conference is officially opened. Uh, enjoy yourself, and uh, we will move on to the uh, opening plenary lecture. Hi, good morning. Um, I'll put the slides up just. Uh, be all on the same page and share the screen. All right. Um, so it is my pleasure as well to uh, welcome all of you once again to uh, GCC 2022. Um, my uh, task here is to introduce the scientific program um, that we have slated for the next uh, four days, as well as our opening keynote speaker. Um, so all the content um, is linked from our sketch site, um, which is linked here um, on, on the site and you probably know of it uh, so far. So overall, we, um, we have um, four fellowship awardees um, that are sponsored by an anonymous donor on behalf of our uh, beloved late James Taylor. We have received 66 abstracts um, for uh, demos, posters, and, and talks. Uh, of those, 45 talks, uh, um, equaling about seven and a half hours of content, will be uh, presented over the course of the next four days. We have 51 posters and demos. Uh, you can see many of them already on the uh, side of this room. If you have a poster, you're welcome to hang it up um, at any point from now on. Um, just please do take it down in the last day of the conference, otherwise, uh, Someone's going to throw it in the trash, and it is your precious work. So, um, um, overall, the, uh, the the content has been uh, written, reviewed, uh, and talked about talked about uh, by 208 authors. Uh, all the abstracts are at that uh, bitly link, um, so you, you can get the, the full content of those if you uh, miss anything in the presentation or the slides. 
the Galaxy Training Network, the GTN, organized uh, 20 training events. So we have five parallel sessions uh, for, per, uh, for each of the four days. Um, and all this uh, is brought to you or so has been vetted by uh, 38 scientific uh, committee members that, um, that reviewed the abstracts and decided um, how stuff uh, or what gets incorporated and, and suggested some, uh, some areas for improvement. I'd also like to thank my partners on the uh, scientific organizing committee, uh, so Sabina, Asunta, and Bea, uh, for uh, sifting through this and organizing it and putting it into a, a format that we all hopefully will appreciate over the next uh, four days. Um, so again, this is the, the full program is online. Um, we have um, kind of grouped the talks based on their theme um, to, to kind of focus the areas. Again, um, these great tables, please uh, move forward and slide the, the screen is not particularly large, so it may um, help you to, uh, to get the, the, to the bottom of the content by uh, sitting up closer. Um, something that I want to highlight uh, from the scientific program is the fact that we have um, what we consider three keynote talks um, in uh, over the next four days. So in a few seconds, we'll have our opening keynote, Hong Kong Liu, who's uh, sitting here. I'll tell, say a little more about uh, her in a second. Tomorrow at 4.45 p.m., there's the, uh, the project update by the project PIs. And then um, on Wednesday, the, uh, the last day of the, the meeting at 11.20 a.m., we have uh, Chris uh, Pignanelli from UMN um, doing the, uh, the closing keynote. Uh, as you will see from these uh, keynote talks, sort of the inspirational confidence theme as we um, look to, to, to be inspired by the, the keynote uh, speakers is this uh, notion of translational clinical science. We, with Galaxy has been around 15 years and um, it is increasingly starting to see adoption outside of uh, training and academia alone. Um, and so these, these talks are here to, uh, uh, to help us see the future. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, first opening uh, keynote speaker, uh, Hong Kong Yu. Um, she got her PhD in 2002 from the city uh, 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 city of New York University, I'm no, sorry, uh, City University of New York. Uh, she is currently a uh, Richard M. Slander Professor and Director of the uh, Biomedical Informatics at the uh, Center for Clinical and Translational Science at Mayo Clinic, which is in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, about an hour south of here. Uh, her research focuses on facilitating the uh, secondary use of clinical data uh, for clinical and translational science and healthcare delivery. She uses techniques from uh, data science, machine learning, and natural language processing um, to uh, make the, that data more available in the, uh, in the point, of, uh, point of care uh, environment. She's a fellow of the uh, American College of uh, Medical Informatics and a leader of the Natural Language Processing Working Group at the uh, American Medical Inform um, Informatics Association. She also co-organizes a conference. She's, she's uh, familiar with uh, what goes into organizing one of these. Uh, hers is uh, IEEE, um, uh, IEEE International Conference on Healthcare Informatics. It was held um, last month. And with that, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Liu and uh, ask her to uh, open the conference on the, uh, the scientific note. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where's the slack? Oh. <laughs> so wonderful. Thank you for the for the introduction. Thank you for the organizer for inviting me here. And this is actually probably the first in-person keynote in the last three years. Um, so great to be here in, in person. Um, so when, when the organizer reached out to me for keynotes, I would say, I guess make a mistake. I, I know Galaxy, but I never contribute. <laughs> um, so uh, and later I checked the program and I tried to see, maybe I come here to learn uh, from you all and I try to see how do we, um, you know, and learn from here to, to see how we can um, you know, uh, reach out to, to open the community, which I led called Open House Natural Language Processing Collaborative. So this is also an open science journey towards the real world implementation of um, clinical LP. So as you learn from Mayo Clinic, and so the, all the work 
you know, it's not possible without a healthcare institution, which is a nice um, kind of experimental test bed from a lot of work. So outline of the talk, I will first uh, discuss about uh, uh, clinical natural language processing and also try to uh, follow by the clinical RP application in the context of clinical research. And this is actually uh, compli complicated than what I originally thought as a, a researcher. Uh, then talk about uh, our effort in the open house natural language processing, which tried to set up a open science community for us to collaborate and move the field forward. Lastly, um, through some of the lessons learned, um, some perspective of how we want to move this community forward, uh, which I see inspiration already that the Galaxy community have a very nice, uh, you know, this kind of training, which may, I probably will borrow from that to try to start a open house natural language processing uh, uh, community forum. Um, so many of you know, um, you know, the, with the um, high tech uh, act in 2009, many of the healthcare organizations um, have um, their uh, data to be uh, digitalized. So we call this digital transformation of the healthcare. And right now, um, over 90% of the um, healthcare practice and the providers using electronic health records for their uh, practice uh, data. This will give a great opportunity, which we call um, to, to advance the field for many healthcare system. Basically the point of care data, uh, which are captured through the, um, you know, uh, electronic health records and other forms, those can be leveraged for um, generate um, data-driven insights and uh, a knowledge about the clinical research. And those can be generated to get um, evidence for, um, um, for practice. And those can follow a loop to advance. So it's a learning healthcare system. Um, now, one of the data in the electronic health records, a lot of you probably familiar is the clinical notes or clinical documentations. Uh, we know we try to different, I mean, basically different from the experimental data uh, we generally do through the, uh, you know, high group, uh, you know, those technologies, which is done in the experimental settings in the clinical domain, when we deal with EHR data, we, we see a dramatic amount of information actually unstructured, not computationally accessible. One of the technology which adopt is the more as, you know, how do we get information from those unstructured EHR data. And the technology popular adopt is natural language processing. Um, as a computer science side, when we look at a computer, uh, natural language processing, we may look at the left figure where we have um, text data. From the text data, we go through those language, um, natural language processing, uh, you know, syntactic processing, semantic processing, uh, programmatic processing, uh, come up with structure representation. That's generally what we uh, see from the core RP side. But in the clinical setting, actually, the majority of the time, when people talk about natural language processing, that can be in the right figure, can be anything along those lines. So when you see an article talk about, I use, the, um, you know, we use NLP techniques, it can be anything from machine learning, from information extraction, from information retrieval, can be from text mining technology, uh, text classification. So all those um, in, our learning healthcare system part on, you can see they are all called probably natural language processing. So um, just to give a, a more detail uh, regarding one of the common tasks, um, the task is relatively uh, simple, which is you have a natural language. Here is a severe active leg pain with muscle weakness. Um, the task itself is just to try to standardize and uh, long, uh, to a computational representation that can be used uh, for downstream application. And uh, for this community, I don't need to emphasize uh, in the open science, we always say standards in probabilities uh, 
is key uh, for the open science collaboration. And uh, the same thing in the clinical domain too, if we got data, and the standards is, uh, um, is necessary for synthetic um, uh, interoperability and the semantic interoperability. So here, the popular standards used in the uh, clinical data side is the HL7 fire. Uh, it is uh, 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 capture both synthetic standards as well as the semantic standards, try their best. So it's capture 80%, we say it's 80% of the semantics that can be um, instantiated through the HL7 fire. So the task itself is, you know, transform the text data to a structured representation. Um, take a little bit of deep um, dive into the task. It's, it's a traditional natural language processing steps, but uh, informed with the terminology ontology standards there. So the things to which we show on the, on the um, the processing steps here is involved, you know, some of the synthetic processing steps, which is dependency passing, and where you set up the dependency be, uh, among the uh, tokens you have. Then you do, um, you know, terminology mapping standardization. So this will go back to uh, uh, um, what we show here is the unified medical language system that the ID. So we call QIs. So you extract those concepts. Then you go to relation detection, which is currently is a direct relation extraction. Then you do relationship classification. After that, you can do the alignment with uh, a HL server fire. So, so in general, um, there are a lot of um, clinical NLP um, applications um, which are say we are doing uh, standardization. This is what they are doing uh, basically. And another uh, popular task in the clinical domain actually is the um, application driven. Basically, um, you know, I have a specific task such as the cohort identification and uh, how do I extract uh, relevant information from the unstructured data. Um, for the structured data, sometimes we use the normalization, uh, which is the general ETL process we're using. But that for unstructured data, uh, the technology really is information extraction technology. So here I'll show you an example. Uh, one of the condition, um, some of our um, researchers, uh, clinical research interest is for silent brain infection. This is a, a silent stroke, uh, which is incidental findings. Um, basically, um, when you take head um, CT or MRI, um, you can have um, a silent stroke, which is the oldest stroke happened before, which you never uh, know. And those are silent, um, called silent brain infection. In that uh, cases, it's not a codified because it's incidental findings. So you don't have code for that, structure code, a diagnosis code for that. So if, if a researcher wants to study um, silent brain infection, uh, do we give them uh, stroke prevention um, medications or not? In order to do those kind of studies, they need to identify those patients. But that's not as easy because it's not a codified. The only way they can get it is from the uh, radiology reports, the neural image reports they, they have. So then the technology used here is just uh, have a template uh, hierarchy for silent brain infection, which we want to get is, uh, you know, four uh, slots. And then from the uh, reports, we try to fill those four slots. So, so those are um, things which um, we see some value, which the uh, text data, the LP techniques can bring to the, to the clinical research. Um, in 2019, 2020, uh, we, we as, the, as the research team, we started to see, you know, we have been doing clinical natural language for over 20 years. What are the uh, current uh, landscape? Um, what have been used? So we did some, uh, uh, literature review. Uh, so this is generally show um, for that article in 2019, um, 20, um, this, uh, 2018, 
Um, what we what we did is the you know try to do a literature review, basically um, getting all the articles to talk about um, peak, talk about EHR, talk about the clinical data, and then we extract them, try to see what's the um, what's the situation is. Um, this figure four shows you. Um, the increasing number of um, clinical NLP research. And unfortunately, majority of them still publish in clinical medicine journal and the informatics journal. Those are the um, red line and the green line. Many of you are probably aware with the, um, you know, deep learning technology and uh, transformer based technology the general NLP community, they are, um, they, are, they are greatly increased with a lot of publications and very uh, difficult to get in. But here in the clinical NLP literature since 2017, this is the situation. Not much publications are run from the traditional computer science side. Um, and uh, the systems used by those um, um, publication generally prior to 2000, most of the publication used two systems, one is called Medley, one is MetaMap. Those are two expert-based systems. Um, Medley is from uh, the Columbia University and the MetaMap from the National Life Medicine. Um, both are developed in Prolog. <laughs> How many of you now do for log? <laughs> In 2003 uh, forward, um, we, we see uh, adoption of some of the uh, um, infrastructure uh, platform type of technology, including EOE market, with our popular um, clinic, uh, popular natural language processing uh, development uh, infrastructure framework. We also see machine learning status to um, so around 2003 forward, I started to uh, see a lot of machine learning related technology. And of course, from 10 to 17, 18 forward, uh, we see those uh, dramatic, um, the field dramatically uh, uh, advanced just using various deep learning and transformer based techniques. And this will give you uh, some um, um, intuitive there's a methodology review about. The, how the field was uh, um, working in the clinical natural language processing. So you can see um, the dramatic uh, um, 10 to 18 is a peak. So our previous review was done in 10 to 17. So we have now to see that a huge peak about the 10 to 18, 10 to 19 forward. This is the uh, um, many uh, deep learning related technology being used. Um, those are showing you the uh, popular, um, uh, you know, deep learning uh, large language models uh, people are using and uh, leading um, moving forward. And in, the, in those seminar reveal, we also see, you know, um, you know, the, the, this, this article is published in 2020. We are not actually see the deep learning related um, technology be translated to the informatics journal to the uh, clinical journal. And this is show you the dominant approach people taking. Uh, you, you have a lot using a, a combination of rule based and the uh, machine learning based technology. Uh, some are in hybrid, but the deep learning only about 80% uh, of the applications uh, using the technology. Of course, there are the clinical RPB use uh, for all different kinds of purpose. Some for uh, you know, clinical research, which is uh, doing the disease study area. Some doing clinical workflow optimization. And then you see drug related studies as well as um, deal with the social determinant of health. Uh, all kinds of the document type being leveraged. Um, CN stands for clinical notes. So you see radiology reports. See some use this chart summary, and the, the information they extracted that come, you know, uh, along those lines. And uh, when you talk to clinical researchers, um, for people who um, get started with the clinical NLP, 
and people uh, mind can be quite simple. Give me data, I apply technology and I get results. So the data here means <laughs> the data in the um, in the um, clinical LP side or in general LP side is the most expensive resource um, you know, need uh, developed. So what we found is that uh, for any of the clinical LP projects we're working on, any of the applications, we spend the majority of the time deal with uh, um, how to formulate that clinical uh, research projects um, to a reasonable clinical RP tasks, and then how to create a gold standard uh, to, to handle that. And there's a significant challenge here, actually, uh, because um, it's kind of involve uh, three different ent uh, entities here. One is us, which are computer science engineer and data scientists. Then we have the clinical researchers uh, in there. And we also have the data uh, generate uh, the original people who write those data, right? Those documents are secondary use. Um, the, the, the authors of those documents are not really the consumer, the researchers who use that documents. And we as um, um, uh, researchers, uh, as a computer scientist, also don't know the language of which in those of uh, both sides. And the authors of those documents may also, um, um, their original um, purpose is for care, not really for your clinical research. So you have significant data quality issue and those things and how to do a reasonable um, task and meet the expectation require a lot of negotiation and uh, discussion. So, um, Clinical LP, uh, um, in general, LP itself generally involve, um, you know, the task uh, formulation um, where the, as I already mentioned, the task itself is over 80% of the resource um, to generate that data sets to do the model development and evaluation. Even you have the advanced learning like, um, few short learning, uh, zero short learning, you still needed to evaluate the performance, you still needed to create the resource. And the number of trainings that's generally in the clinical RP side or the gold standard is, is only in a couple of hundreds or you know, less than one thousand documents. So to, just to tell you that the task, even those one thousand documents, if you do the RP annotation, do the clinical annotation itself, but adding on top of that, that's uh, actually a lot of resources uh, needed. Um, so um, meanwhile, in the core NLP side, we also try to see what the methods work. And so there is a shared task related uh, um, um, work there to advance the, the RP science itself. So in this article by uh, Ziyong, it's discussed a lot of things regarding uh, community challenges in biomedical text mining over 10 years. <coughs> this article described detailed key messages that challenge um, those, those resources created for those uh, challenge, for those community ch challenge is critical for, to advance the field forward. It's important for training and uh, education. And this is <clears throat> this figure shows the biological challenges. I uh, many of you probably are aware of this, and also the associated clinical challenge. Uh, you may wonder why we have few clinical challenge. Um, the major issue is related to uh, the clinical data, especially text data. They contain PHI information due to the HIPAA privacy um, pieces. Um, we don't have much public data uh, available in the clinical domain. And the only one which popularly available is mimic, uh, mimic data sets. And those are a list of the clinical LP, uh, on the, the challenges uh, organized over the years and what's their um, general uh, purpose for the task. So you can see some are um, 
some are classification tasks, some are you know, information extraction tasks, some are you know, allophoric resolution, all those different um, tasks. So, so why the task is uh, quite a challenge. Uh, so go back to um, the corpus annotation in the south. Um, so this is a required manual chart review and not just um, marking the uh, linguist, linguistic and uh, information, sometimes it's also clinical information. Um, so the task itself um, actually requires domain experts. Uh, you may hear, um, you know, some of the uh, people uh, trying to create corpus using, um, you know, crowdsourcing, all those things. In the clinical domain, it's a challenge too, because the data can have to be sent into, for example, um, Amazon Health to, to do the crowdsourcing annotation. Uh, so secondly, some, some of the interpretation of those uh, uh, clinical information actually require people with the uh, clinical knowledge in order to interpret it. And that's also uh, additional ta uh, challenges. Um, so, um, you know, we actually generally spend a lot of time to talk to <laughs> clinical research team, try to tell them, you know, how to get that information. And then you need to start to tell them it's not a magic, you need a trainer system. And then let's try to see how humans do with all those tasks. So a lot of times you probably hear people say, I want your system to achieve over, you know, 90% sensitivity specificity. Uh, while when we um, ask the two independent uh, physicians to do that notation, they may achieve about 50, 60 in terms of data agreement. So we, we, we actually are using that as a, um, um, as a benchmark um, to show um, if, you know, the, the things which we can achieve at the end with an RP algorithm is to achieve what you can achieve as a human. Uh, rather than uh, uh, Oracle there. Um, and the, the system <coughs> development itself uh, can be many different technology. And we found, um, found out when we, when we work with clinical research teams, sometimes the rule-based approach um, work much better because what happened is that um, if I train a machine learning algorithm and, uh, and that model cannot fix the error where clinical research detected, it's uh, not a fixable, it, it, they will not trust the system. So in the first iteration, you say you make a mistake. I tell you the mistake. In the new model, you generally you still make that mistake. That's the future. This, this is uh, the trust of the RP technology become in English if we don't do that. However, sometimes you use post processing rules using um, you know, their knowledge to translate to the, um, to the algorithm. They find it's accept acceptable. Actually, a lot of times they, they need to be responsible to fix the, those uh, errors because they detected um, So in the evaluation side, um, this is a very different from the traditional RP um, tasks. When we evaluate the clinical RP tasks or projects, sometimes so what we need is actually, um, you know, patient level information. Does that patient um, have a diagnosis of asthma, for example? Um, document level means that uh, does this document the document a, 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 a test results? Some are concept level, which is uh, um, similar to uh, land language recognition and uh, those type of tasks. Some even episode. Uh, episode is uh, basically the encounter type of information. And um, so we use the traditional, you know, RP measurements. But uh, a lot of times we have some additional consideration of the RP approach we are uh, taking. 
First is robustness, uh, can the performance stay over uh, remain stable over time, and the portability and the generability. Um, does that algorithm need to be deployed at a different institution? Um, the producibility, transparency, explainability, also some measurements we need to see. The reason it's critical here is that because you want to communicate the RP um, results to the clinical researchers. Uh, as I already mentioned, if things um, they cannot understand as a clinical research, they may not trust um, the, the system's output. And of course, their uh, underlying performance bias and AI bias need to be considered. So, <coughs> in, <coughs> in reality, so those are the uh, different LP applications for clinical research. Um, so clinical research generally come from study design, feasibility, study cohort, data connection, data access, outcome dissemination. So in the middle layer, and you can use RP techniques to help with uh, feasibility assessment because we have the electronic health records and we know, um, you know how many people, how many patients have those kind of inclusion exclusion criteria met. And you can also do automated screening, uh, information extraction, and the, uh, the, the last is related to, um, you know, systematic review and content analysis, because the evidence generally for clinical practice come from a lot of trials, and those trials generally have a published article about those trials. And the systematic review um, and analyze the findings uh, is a critical part of the evidence generation for clinical practice. So we mentioned about methods part. This part actually um, was done this year, um, 2021. No, the paper was written this year. The, the, the review was done uh, using the connection from January 2009 to September 2021. We tried to see for those EHR-based uh, studies, how many of them using uh, natural language processing for clinical research. So I emphasize this is for clinical research. And say, so we identify studies, we exclude the studies um, for our methodology studies or pure clinical LP studies. Only those studies which um, were with clinical conclusions was considered included in this. And uh, so we, we, we retrieved that uh, overall at the end, only 50 articles which are actually using LP techniques for their clinical findings. And um, we have about 10 papers is about um, uh, mental behavior related uh, information extraction. Uh, a lot of study are retrospective cohort study. Some are um, cross-sectional study and the case control study. And um, majority of those um, LP empowered observational research, um, their target concepts uh, used is the diseases. We have 4% about medications. Um, but this is, uh, um, again, the same thing about to demonstrating. Um, we, the, the LP um, enabled clinical research where the LP system is used in those applications. Majority of them are web-based systems. And uh, if you check figure B, the B is showing how many articles uh, use EHR to do their observational research, um, which is in the log scale. You see the blue line is, you know, we have dramatic increase. The red line is those which utilize NLP techniques. It's, uh, it's really um, small. If we believe 80% of the clinical information is in clinical notes, and you can assume 
a lot of EHR-based publications using incomplete information to do their clinical research. So there is a significant gap actually. And uh, besides that, uh, we also check the reportings uh, of those observational studies regarding scientific rigor and reproducibility related information. Um, not to our surprise, but maybe surprise us. Um, we see a lot of publications um, don't really mention what they are doing with their, own, what LP is. So we know LP, you know, it's a, it's a term, right? But it, this is a field with many different techniques. So we have 58% of the articles um, didn't mention uh, what model they're using. Uh, the model definition is missing. We see 74% that does not mention any uh, normalization and 58% um, does not uh, um, discuss in what kind of uh, environment that LP system was developed. So you, 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 of course, when we did the review, we also look at the reference, we also look at the appendix and all those information, try to see where we can identify those reporting of their LP articles. And uh, <coughs> very poor reporting for LP uh, for, for clinical research using LP techniques. So why it matters? Because if you, if the reporting, uh, if the LP, um, how it get to that data elements was not clear, how do we reproduce that? So reproducibility for this community don't, don't need to emphasize. Scientific research is always about reproducibility. It's just the foundation of a trusted science and discovery. Um, I think many of you probably through the COVID pandemic, the real world evidence. So you see so many conflict information going around about you know, clinical evidence. And this is to us, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a failure uh, in our community to um, um, ensure transparency and the reproducibility of uh, the research. Um, in the secondary use of EHR, we have the uh, inconsistency in data documentation, objective or priority. We have ambiguous disease definition. We have very, very high heterogeneity of EHR plus system and the process variation. They are not experimentally applied data. And the majority of the data have a context which are not uh, explicitly captured and available for the uh, um, data science projects. And um, even worse because of the HIPAA uh, regulation, also because that is a belief healthcare data, um, you know, is have, have business uh, uh, potential intellectual property associated with it. This is this confidentiality in there. So, so the process how, you know, the data eventually come with the data sets and the quality, all those things are, are missing. And there's the information quality describe practice the variation the complexity and also the representation. Uh, we have significant data fragmentation issue facing the patient records. At the same time, we have this reporting gap, the accessible information quality. Uh, if we truly adopt, you know, um, believe a clinical research, we want the data to be there to support it. In the clinical domain, you may at the end uh, just to say due to HIPAA, the data set's not available to you uh, for, your, for your reproducibility analysis. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we even wonder, okay, the process, uh, you know, the data not available, can you tell us how exactly you get that data? And those are also not available uh, for a lot of research studies um, because it's actually in order to get that data, how many different teams actually need to be involved? You involve healthcare IT, 
it, it probably involve uh, EHR system vendors. So it probably involve the person who are doing uh, data retrieval. There are so many different layers around the data, but at the end, it's a nightmare for reproducibility um, and, or replicability if you try to think about um, try to replicate the process in a different way. So given that um, for the clinical NLP solutions, um, the, the, the big chunk of why we have not really translate to real world uh, implementation for supporting a lot of clinical um, uh, observational studies. There are many contextual factors uh, around it. There are many human factors um, here showing you the research stakeholders and the discipline, discipline expertise need to be involved when you do the implementation. Um, many contextual factors, um, you know, one year try implementation is one year try implementation. We also notice one LP algorithm for one specific research study, also just one LP algorithm. There's um, not a generalizable portable for a different context. And sometimes because of the missing information, you don't really have a, a way to know if that NLP algorithm will work or not without a truly evaluated. Uh, that. So <laughs> many, many contextual heterogeneity factors. Um, I, we believe if we can document those um, explicitly, and we can improve the uh, reproducibility of those systems. And then we are recommending uh, uh, some of those tasks to be um, you know, documented. So those are the recommendations uh, also available in, the, in our uh, uh GitHub page. <coughs> so, um, so this is to give you <laughs> some example is that um, when you finish develop model, it's not really enough. And actually you, you also need to evaluate and do error analysis and try to convey with the clinical research team to say if those are acceptable. Um, some of the um, errors can be um, may not be fixable. And some of, the, some of the errors can be fixed by adding additional post-processing rules patterns. So um, let us go to um, the open house natural language processing. So all those just to say, you know, you cannot, um, you cannot, to, to, to improve the trustworthy of clinical research, improve reproducibility of EHR based research. We needed the things to be open. And um, one of the efforts uh, towards that is the Open House Natural Language Consortium. Uh, this was established in 2009 uh, through the Mayo Clinic IBM collaboration. And uh, many of you probably here in the healthcare domain, uh, there are popular systems. Um, one is the uh, CTEX that's come from Mayo Clinic, and then the other system is for the oncology side. This is from the IBM. This is 2009. You may wonder why, why they have two different systems. Um, those are UEMA based um, kind of um, infrastructure. From 2009 to 2013, um, through this project, the OHMRP was focusing on, um, you know, um, document. Um, the representing the uh, LP uh, structured results to facilitating semantic interoperability. So you may not see this diagram clearly, but this is just showing you the target of LP representation. Um, semantic representation was showing this, this big bob. And this actually uh, similar to fire standards. And we incorporate that into uh, 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 data normalization architecture for, uh, for EHR. And all those are the uh, technology we're using. We're using the NoSQL database store 
uh, we use, uh, you know, um, some of the, um, the ETL process and the parallel process in there. In the 13th and the 17th, the project was uh, funded as uh, uh, our one project um, back then was the focus on, okay, we have so many RP systems, but they are basically doing similar things. Um, how, which one to adopt and use, and how do we adopt and use them? So, so those are the uh, efforts we try to um, move to, you know, define more, uh, you know, using uh, filters and the wrappers to wrap existing systems and uh, bring um, LP a front end to end users. And lastly, try to study the uh, interoperability, usability, and real world use cases and uh, <coughs> move to the cloud. And the 2017, 2022, um, back then, uh, which um, focusing on, you know, uh, it's, it's receiving an innovation award to try to uh, move all those things a little bit uh, in what's uh, generating data. And uh, for the general community, facilitating data sharing and uh, use the data for privacy preserving uh, related to computation of phenotyping and uh, how to partner with various uh, entities. So the MY, actually, this work was done um, at University of Minnesota, the LP team, uh, which is uh, um, wrapping all the uh, popular clinical LP systems. Um, into uh, Docker uh, solutions and uh, so that the whole process uh, can be handled uh, in a parallel uh, high performance way and with many LP systems um, results available to be processed at the same time. And the work on the M2, which is uh, generated synthetic data for use for training um, machine learning algorithm. What we found is that we actually can use uh, synthetic data generation techniques to generate um, some corpus available for public so that people can use that to um, test on various uh, machine learning related technology in various applications. We actually found the system performed better than the original raw data, uh, original gold standard uh, due to the fact that the uh, gun related technology helped smooth out the noise. In the privacy preserving uh, field, um, we did a, a lot of work uh, in this space is to try to see how can we um, using a, a a distributed filtering framework for NLP artifacts and uh, to do tensor factorization for privacy preserving uh, collaborative health data analysis. So there are all kinds of techniques um, which can be leveraged. But this on the condition is that the data at each institution allow us to be um, computationally uh, accessible. We're not talking about human accessible. And we also emphasize with the various uh, clinical data research network community to help uh, push the NLP uh, forward with through partnership. And one of the projects we involved in the last two years is this national COVID cohort collaborative. And this is the partnership between uh, private and uh, some of the distributed networks. And uh, so, so this is the statistics of the data, uh, M3C data collab. If you are interested in this, I strongly encourage you to join this community. So this is the uh, uh, largest of ever available patient records, uh, anonymously available to, to uh, researchers as long as your institution sign data use agreement. We have 5.5 uh, COVID positive cases to, <coughs> 1.4, uh, one, I mean, 14.3 meaning uh, people. So, so there are many people there. Uh, 
in this data sets. And as you see, they have national representations. So I've been asked to contribute to the uh, natural language processing techniques, um, which is um, um, actually quite a challenge. Uh, we through the in 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 June 20, um, uh, 20 we've been uh, asked to do that. We assessed uh, what are the institutions with NLP capability. We found that only a handful of uh, uh, institutions has NLP capability in their clinical data research warehouse. A very few have ability to run and extract and run NLP algorithms. And a very few institutions have computing infrastructure ready for deploy those algorithms. Even we have NLP models, we have NLP algorithms, but the, there's no, you know, from people process technology perspective, not um, out there. So in order to do that, we actually end up, you know, trying to get an end-to-end -end minimal viable product for their NLP deployment. Um, we've been uh, handled uh, uh, a dozen sites to do the deployment. Um, <clears throat> the technology basically using a Apache Beam and a Flink and try to set up this, uh, you know, kind of spark environment for people to run their NLP. And uh, today that's, the, we deployed NLP in about 11 sites. There are totally seven, four sites at the N3C. We only have data from five sites in the, in the, in the data enclave. Only 5% of the patients so we have the NLP result available. It's, it's, it's a big gap. I was just trying to emphasize that. So how do we move forward? Um, I mean, this, this conference has given me some inspiration. First, we need to train people. <laughs> we need to make sure, you know, we have the platform, we have the infrastructure, we have the best practice, we have all those. But if you don't really uh, have a training uh, um, program going to help the sites um, um, with the necessary technology um, staff, they will not be able to do that. So, um, so this is just reflecting, you know, even there are so many uh, EHR-based uh, uh, observational research, very small number are using LP. I want to emphasize very small number are actually is multi-sites. Majority of those studies is single site study. Uh, we know there's a population, um, you know, difference uh, across different healthcare systems. So there's a significant opportunity for us to work as, a, um, you know, to improve the multi-size uh, research um, capability. So this is the thought. Um, we, we no longer can do what we generally, as a core of researchers, you already do. We actually need to take a little bit different approach. We cannot ask people to give us data and we need a, a federal RP development and uh, evaluation framework. We need a trust of process to be helping um, getting the domain experts and getting uh, the team together. And we as a community, as a tool side, probably can set up a common uh, environment and the toolkits for those community to adopt. And uh, so, we call this a circular centric ethical AI framework to advance the field. <laughs> so there are two principles we thought we were thinking need to be there. One is the fair data principles. Second is implementation principles. Um, for, for, the clean, for, for, for the analytics to be deployed in learning healthcare systems and for clinical knowledge um, derivation, you need the process to be correct, and you need the results to be correct uh, through make the process transparent and implementable, make the results extendable and reproducible. And this is crucial for, for the clinical research to trust the LP system and trust the data scientists. Um, and we actually uh, explore this more and it have a, a, a institution infrastructure to handle that is that we want to bring LP as a, um, as a service to the community. 
they may use words, so it's fine to use words, so it's, it's okay um, because they know what, what they document, where they document. Um, but we need to preserve those intelligence and we need to preserve that. So we need the tool to be human centric, to empower them. We no longer can do that and say, we give me the data I develop for you. This is no longer work. It needs to be a team science collaboration. And um, we hope, you know, as we already emphasized, the many contextual variations across the different institutions for any uh, PR algorithm to be deployed at the local sites need to have uh, a gold standard need to be created. So we, we have this uh, annotation tool just developed in the last uh, year to help uh, people generate uh, federated uh, um, LP uh, connect connections. This is a privacy preserving type of technology. We use the serverless uh, techniques uh, to handle that. So we bring the gold standard creation um, the data to be distributed, but the uh, gold standard creation can be uh, coordinated. So in general, as the OHRP community moving forward, we want to sit in the middle to help the clinical LP research community uh, to translate uh, their data to have scalable solutions. We no longer can afford uh, you know, so many research studies Based on EHR data, don't use abstract data. Um, we will miss a lot of information and the results may not be accurate. And I think that's uh, the end. Um, I, I, this is the lab members, and I also thank all the uh, funding agency as well as many collaborators. And uh, thank you. So, um, open for questions. Any questions? What's the process for extracting information from EHR records without violating the HIPAA privacy? So, um, so basically, um, EHR itself uh, for the clinical notes, um, most of the clinical records allow to you, you to do the clinical research. But with the IRB approval, uh, your human service records uh, uh, teams approval. And most of the data need to be uh, in a high trust environment to, to ensure uh, there's no privacy um, leaking. Um, would it would extend to medical records as well? Like if you Actually, their data is a golden uh, to to uh, to a lot of the community because they have less data fragmentation issue than with the others. But uh, you know, I, I think there there are a lot of uh, um, LP empowered predictive modeling work. Actually, the, the VA is the um, organization actually using those, for example, for uh, mental health related Sorry, support. I think, I, was, I think you're referring to the VA, like the veterans. I yeah. Mean, I was trying to say veterans, uh, animals. Uh, animals. Animals. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> veterans will get privacy. Yeah, we'll oh, yeah. we, we actually want to look at that back when I had a PhD student. I'm not sure if he's here. But the, he was uh, helping with the um, veteran of the EHR, I don't know, EHR records. There, there, there is still a privacy issue because there's a uh, uh, neighborhood information and all those information in, in the animal in job. But there is one house, one house uh, initiative, which is talk about how do we use the animal and the human together to improve the house because a lot of it, you know, infection disease and environment related things are shared uh, among the human and the animal. But it's good you mentioned that. I was thought I was thinking of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have that side of the room, Mike. Yes, I mean, you mentioned this adoption gap a few times, and it's really striking. I think, I think you showed maybe just a few percent of groups are using it. 
And you mentioned a few barriers, you know, um, just having the sort of the technology in place to extract and run the algorithms and, and training. I'm wondering if there's other kind of issues that you've identified. And then uh, broadly, how can Galaxy help you? How can we work together? So, um, so you know, basically, so the adoption is, is a kind of mixture because, you know, most of the healthcare organizations, um, they are, they're vendor related um, kind of things. They probably buy products, but LP itself, um, when you use um, in the, um, in the without the context, it's a kind of still a lot of uh, challenges there because the performance will not achieve to the level you wanted for your end downstream application. But at the same time, we don't have enough expertise to be in training in the domain. Um, what happened because, you know, traditional <laughs> graduate schools, most of them are not in a um, healthcare organization, don't have access to healthcare data. And that's a big, bring a gap. And uh, the same time, you know, healthcare organization does not want to share data. So they consider their business confidential information there. I mean, there are also legal HIPAA related things, but sometimes we feel that's not the primary reason why so much adoption gap. Um, but meanwhile, as I mentioned, because of the um, natural language processing problematic um, and the past generally being um, used for clinical application is a problematic semantic processing. We view that as the AI hub function. And the only way to be able to handle that is giving them context uh, to be specific um, there with the um, with the evaluation uh, to be planned uh, with corpus created to evaluate those solutions. Without evaluation, you cannot deploy that. So this is something as any of the AI models and algorithms, uh, you cannot uh, simply deploy without uh, evaluation. But how many institutions have expertise to create enough to do the evaluation? Yeah. Go from there. I don't know. It might be a little implementation, but you had mentioned in, in speaking about validation that if you ask two physicians, for instance, to come up with the, the outcome that you're looking for, maybe their DPA or IPA is very low. Well. And so when you see that, how do you deal with that? So, so I mean, if the humans can't do the job, how do you let the computer do it? <laughs> and, and I'm asking because we face these challenges too at a slightly different level. <laughs> so um, I think it's a, uh, the, we do the judification and the consensus building and all those things around it. So the, the best practice um, we have available in the electronic GitHub page have all the details. So um, basically most of the time when they have disagreement because they don't understand the past to clear it. So you break the past, you train them, you bring back them to do the iterative refinement as the agreement, what do you want to call this? And uh, so this, the, the training part of the annotation can improve that dramatically, uh, can improve from 50, 60, you know, moderate type of agreement to a high, uh, you know, high interpretive agreement. But the, the, the things is also come to, they needed to know, you know, you have disagreement with each other. If, you know, when you don't do that uh, um, consensus building, this is what the system will be. So, um, but the most of the system after those best practice uh, implementation, they actually can do the task. But now because the whole team have a common understanding of what the uh, they can do, the, the algorithm actually achieved much better performance that will be very useful for the clinical research because it's replicating their child review process. And you will be surprised. Many of the clinical research data sets, I personally don't trust them to have high quality. We notice a lot of the uh, manually child review study cohort, they have mistakes. Uh, and there's so many mistakes there. So, 
a lot of the times we do iterative uh, error analysis with them, we notice that half of the time it's a false positive. I mean, basically, um, the gold standard of human made half of the mistake and I can make the other half of the mistake. All right, one more question. Oh, no, all right. Uh, we are at time, so uh, if you have questions, I got a couple. Uh, yeah, I will right be now, here so, around the... Um, yeah, we got a break, so uh, yeah. come uh, and talk to uh, Hong Kong and uh, see what else she, she can offer you. Um, besides that, we have a break. Poster session is starting in about 15 minutes from now, so if you have a poster uh, scheduled for today, please uh, hang it up in, um, during that time. And uh, thank you again. Uh, Thank you.